Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And you know, the XRP Ledger Foundation, it has been launched and it was launched to drive this growth and development of the core XRP Ledger and the community. I know a little bit about this project and it's been working very, very hard at this for a long time. I, I know more than a year. And I need to just tell you a few things that I think is important to know that it's independent, it is nonprofit, and it is mission critical to drive the adoption of the XRP ledger. They received 6.5 million, and that came from a combination of Coil, Ripple, and GateHub. And I think it's going to serve the developers very well in this community. And it's going to be able to, I think, create a lot of exciting projects on the ledger. And I look forward to doing whatever I can to help them be successful. I hope you do too. Moving to a new Genesis mining research poll. This one was very, very fascinating. It's about money and banking. And the answers were, well, from surprising to shocking. 22 questions in all, all of them really good questions, but I'm gonna just choose three for this video and let's see how you do. First question, number one, what is the US dollar backed by? How would you answer that? Some of the answers were, bonds, oil, 28.5% said gold, 12% said they didn't know. The answer is, is it's not backed by any physical commodity, zero. It's backed by faith, the full faith and credit of the U.S. government. Question number two, does your bank need to hold the exact amount of money that customers deposit at all times? We're talking about the United States here. So do they have to have that exact amount that equal the amount of deposits that were made? Yes or no? Well, the answer again was quite surprising. 36.3% of those polled felt that yes, of course, banks have to hold those deposits on a one-to-one -one at all times. No, they don't. In fact, up until March, 2020, banks with less than $16 million didn't even have to have any cash reserves. And the larger banks that were over 122 million, they needed to hold only 10%, but today, with the global situation that we are all challenged with, the minimum reserve was reduced to zero for all. Unbelievable. And as a side note, for trust, banks are trusted more than police, Congress, media, lawyers. Bank of America received the highest trust, while Wells Fargo received the least amount of trust. And the last question, should the US government replace phys physical cash with a digital only dollar? And only 24.8% said yes, 60% said no. So people still have this, I don't know if you'd call it a high trust with physical currency, or maybe it's they don't really understand well enough about the digital assets. So every October since 2003, it has been the National Cyber Security Awareness Month. And what a perfect time for us to learn a little bit about the sales job that many VPNs do on people. And I was given a little bit of help with this. This is at Sarah X on Twitter. And he shared some of those general 
issues with so-called VPNs in a video that I want to just pull out a couple of portions. So first, have a listen. If there is a single worst piece of advice on how to protect your online privacy, it'll be without a doubt using a VPN. Okay, I'm just going to pull these clips out, short and sweet. VPNs make you anonymous. The most common and deceptive claim I've seen is using a VPN makes you instantly anonymous. Let me phrase it this way. How can you claim to be anonymous if there is a group of people you've never seen that knows who you are, where you are, and what you're doing online? You see, many VPN providers make big claims about hiding your IP address, which is supposed to make it impossible for someone to see your traffic or know your true IP address, except for the VPN provider. They get to see your IP address and what servers you request. If Edward Snowden used a VPN to leak the NSA documents, he'd get caught before he even thought about stealing the documents. <laughs> Yet very few VPN providers are actually honest about the fact they are your single point of failure you're paying for with your money or data or both. And those that are make broad marketing claims about no locks policy, which doesn't actually mean anything because every network operator keeps some logs for at least some period of time. That's like private instant messaging apps claiming they have no metadata policy. That's impossible. Some basic information about your requests has to travel through their servers, and you'll never have a chance to find out what they actually keep and for how long unless they are kind enough to disclose that information in plain English somewhere in their privacy policies. Even if your VPN provider does everything right, and they delete all the logs immediately from their records, even then you're still entitled to have no expectations of anonymity. Using a VPN, you're only rerouting your traffic through a single entity. Advanced observers like big ISP companies, Google, Amazon, or your government can easily correlate the timings between you making a connection to a VPN server with that server making a connection to a website you want to see. VPN technology does nothing to mitigate these correlation attacks. Anonymity with VPNs is technologically impossible. Next. So I know some of you use a VPN so that you can maybe uh, spoof your geographic location, but I think what I'm trying to point out here is that if you think that it's going to make you private, uh, just have a listen to two more portions I pulled out of this for you. But just downloading a VPN to your system and expecting it to somehow magically protect your identity is a complete joke. It's just not that simple, and anyone claiming instant anonymity and privacy through a product is lying to you. And the last segment of this video. Using your laptop anywhere near your phone, there are techniques that can link your devices and determine they both belong to you. Unless you have an app on your phone with Facebook SDK in it. This Facebook SDK can track your GPS or cellular connection radiating from your phone. Now, you open up your laptop and browse a website with Facebook's tracking script embedded. That tracking script can use microphones and speakers on your devices to inaudibly communicate information to each other and link your VPN laptop with your phone that has active GPS or cellular connection. Thus, not only can Facebook correlate your identity from your phone with your browser activity on your laptop, they can also get your location in real time and figure out you are a user of a VPN service. For the majority of use cases, you can replace a paid or untrustworthy VPN service for a completely free and open source and actually anonymous Tor network. Definitely check out TechWord's video comparing VPNs with Tor, where I'm featured as well. Again. So it's great. If the VPN that you're paying for works for a, a specific purpose that you uh, need, then that's fantastic. But please don't get duped into thinking that it's going to make your IP address, for example, private, because that's not always the case. And as you can see, it's not just that simple that you're going to be anonymous just because you've downloaded this VPN. And the American Bankers Association, they're kicking off their Banks Never Ask That campaign on October 1st as a part of that National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And so I was very curious as to how they were going to equip the banks to do this. So I registered on the website, but I registered as a non-banker, so I could not 
fully get in. However, they had a link to a free webinar. So I thought, okay, I'll definitely check out their webinar. It's unlisted, so it's not something you can find unless you have the URL, but they gave it to me on their website. And when I played the video, I think you're going to be shocked at this 39 minute mark. They're taking some Q and A's. Have a listen. Um, just your bank's logo so that you're able to um, edit those files. Okay. Caitlin, I got a bunch more for you here. So this is a, okay. this is a, this is a pretty simple one. Apparently some people are having problems with the password. Um, how exactly is fight phishing spelled? Because I think someone's having a problem with the password to access the resource. I believe it should be all lowercase, um, one word, fight phishing, th phishing. Um, but Liz, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I believe that is the password. That's Liz, correct. If you're it's on the line, can you, you, why don't you read it? Yeah. This yeah. is Liz Rizzoli, who's been a key member of the ABA team in pushing this uh, campaign forward. Liz, why don't you uh, respond to that question if you could, just to clear up any confusion. Absolutely. The password is all lowercase, one word, and it's fight phishing. So F-I-G-H-T-P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. So no space in between fight and phishing. Unbelievable. So with that video and the given password, I got into the entire site, all the videos, the press kit, uh, the media, which is nicely designed, by the way, and uh, even the quiz that is linked to the money prizes. So I don't know. I think the organizers need a lesson themselves on security. That's for sure. Now, going to some new news that broke today. This is SBI, and they made an announcement that the SBI FX trade site and the SBI VC trade site is going to have this new branding. And they are using a former TV Tokyo announcer, Reina Sumi. And they chose her because uh, the reasons they gave in the announcement is that she appears to be fresh and cheerful and in line with their corporate image. They think it's going to improve trust and have this sense of familiar, famili familiarity, <laughs> can't say that, with Japanese people. And the public relations, along with media promotions, TV, newspaper, magazines, events, and social media, she is going to be the face of the two websites. And you can see that um, being born in 1990, as she was, she is the face of the Gen Ys or Gen X, or I mean Gen Nex, or what most people call millennials. So you can see that she falls in this, in this uh, generation here. After the millennials comes the uh, Gen Z or iGen. They've got two different names. And then for those that were born starting in 2013 and will be born up to 2025, that, that is going to be called the Gen Alpha generation. Interesting, huh? So here she is. This is the SBI VC trade site. Looks good, I think. Yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of her moving forward. And then there is something that broke right before I went to video this, and that is the Ant Group is launching Trustful. And it's a Ant Chain, which is their blockchain, Ant Chain powered global trade and financial services platform for the SMEs, the small to medium sized businesses, with a payments and settlement solution. I want to do a deep dive on this and I will, and I will hopefully have that done for you tomorrow. I think this is some really big news. And this is of course, right before their big 35 million 
no, sorry, $35 billion valuation IPO. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So uh, look forward to that in tomorrow's video. And now we are going to jump to a little fluff. So tiny houses have become all the rage here in Japan. And I, I know I, I have, I have a, I have a, I have a girlfriend who actually had a tiny house up in the Squim area of Washington State. And I have been in it a couple of times. I think she has since sold it, or I do know she was at least rent, renting it out and then has moved into a, a larger home in the, uh, not Port Townsend, not Port Angeles, not Gig Harbor. Oh, I can't remember. Her waterfront view is just unbelievably beautiful. But she went back into a big house. But for right now, tiny houses are all the rage. So this one, as you see, you can um, buy this one for about 25,000 US dollars. And in the area of Kashima, this is a, a real estate company that specializes in tiny houses. And they have a whole bunch of houses that you can choose from that start at about that same price range, around 20, uh, 28,000 to uh, 35,000. They have quite a selection. So, wow, looking at one that's in Tokyo is really something that I think looks quite different on the inside than from the outside. This is a tiny house that is in a neighborhood and it was built by an architect. And now look at the inside. So it has, let me go back on this just slightly. It has this very unusual roof line, right? And I thought that's not so good looking, you know, in terms of its street presence. I thought that's really kind of strange. But inside, this is what you get. Wow. Amazing. The beautiful vaulted airiness, the light that you get with the natural sunlight coming in. And if I just take you down through a few of the photos, it looks very livable. There's the kitchen. And there you can see looking up. How beautiful is that? It's got such a modern look to it, but yet it feels very warm with the combination of the amount of wood with the floor and the wood trim. It doesn't feel cold at all. There's the front view. Yeah. I still, I, I wish I, I wish you could do something with this portion here to make it a little more appealing. I, I think it is looking a little on the scrappy metal side, but the inside doesn't disappoint at all. Wow. So you've got this kind of scrap metal and more like a concrete look, but the warmth of the wood that's used just feels so inviting. Look at that from the bedroom. Looking up through there, this is the piece of property that's so on a very, very small plot of land. There's the elevation. I think all the difference in the world is the vaulted ceilings in this design. Yeah, I think it's very livable. Look at this. Even even you can do uh, a shower on the outside or shower on the inside. Hmm. Some of the detail. Really spectacular with the shadow and light. Making use of every inch. I just love this house. How fun is that? So back to the beginning. I hope you enjoyed it because I thought it was a great find.
All right, everybody, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.